I'm not live. I, I don't have anything on my screen. You're up there. What, what's, folks, we got a COVID-19 technology problem here, it appears. They set me up with this computer and said, oh, it'll all be live, and there's nothing there. Kyler? Give it a couple seconds. A couple seconds? I've been... I, I, no, I'm not. Well, I'm not on my screen. Oh, man. We're, we're in a bad way, folks. You can tell that we're out of practice. We haven't done this for how long now? All right. Channel dashboard. Where do I go to channel dashboard? Go live. Come on. Stream. All right. We're not there. Hmm. Thanks for being here, folks. I know we're on episode 85, but uh, this isn't working on my computer here, Kyler. It's uh, searching in YouTube. I thought that I'm doing. I'm searching it in YouTube. Are you? Can you people see me? Yes, they see us. They see me? Can they hear me? Yes. Oh, man, they're probably thinking this guy, this new bird guy, you'd swear he hasn't done this the other 84 times. We've got an imposter today. Uh... All right, there's 82. All right. Whoa. All right, I better mute my audio. It's... All right, here we go, folks. Sorry about that. But, well, hope you're all doing well. Hope you're healthy. Hope you're safe. Um, crazy times. But thanks for being here. Elk Talk Live. We're going to try, go forward, Montana took its COVID-19 restrictions to phase one reopen on the Monday. So we're doing all the things we're supposed to do. We got all the like wipes and uh, the germ killer and everything else. And we're here to answer questions. And a bunch of you already left questions on the Instagram feed and the Facebook feed earlier today when we talked about it. Um, but anyhow, this is brought to you by Onyx Maps. Uh, go to onxmaps.com, use promo code RANDY and save 20% on everything. You already know that, right? If you've tuned into this before, you know all these companies. Botec Archery, loophole.com, go hunt, go there, use promo code RANDY, get $50 to store credit and get in the Wyoming Commissioner's Tag Draw. Gerber Gear, go there, gerbergear.com. Oh, we're going to talk about these tonight. You know what these are? This is the RANDY Newberg Edition. Yeah, gerbergear.com, use promo code Randy, save 20%. Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. We're going to do a bag dump tonight. <clears throat> and one of the things I always carry, it's not in my bag, but it's in my bino harness. I haven't blown on this since last fall. <coughs> hmm. It survived the season. Anyhow, Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls, use promo code Randy, save 15%. Oh, uh, let's see. I wonder what questions you guys want me to answer first. Oh, yeah. Get a haircut, huh? Look at that, man. I got buzzed. Zoom. If I would have been here the other day, I was like, I'm trying to think. If you saw how people wore their hair in the 1970s, like with their Peterbilt kind of convoy trucker hat, that's what I look like, man. It was bad. So, you guys want me to just get right into the bag dump? Should we do that? Get that out of the way, huh? So, someone on Instagram said, why don't you just do a bag dump? And my son Matthew and a few other people are like, yeah, you ought to do a bag dump tonight. So, I brought my pack. So, in my bino harness, I'll talk about what I carry in there, just as a starting point. If you have uh, an adjustable turret on your scope, right, like I do, a Leopold CDS system, you want to have the Allen wrench that allows you, if that thing somehow gets off or you bump it or you want to have that handy, a uh, little bit of dope for your range finder, or if you have specific loads, uh, wind charts, drop charts, if you are worried about, oh, well, what happens if I don't have... Uh, the the dials uh, I have dials so the drop charts aren't anything I worry about but my wind charts I do oh let's see this pack 
I'm going to move this so that everybody can see. How am I doing, guys? Are you okay? All right. <clears throat> Normally, you see me walking with these, right? This is a Mystery Ranch Metcalf pack. And I don't go anywhere without my trekking poles. These are cork lights by Lecky. Oop. Don't drop your pack. A butt pad if the ground's wet or you want to take a little nap. Some of this is not necessary. Some of these are conveniences that I've decided I like to carry with me. And if I have llamas, this pack is not going to be as full. The llamas are going to be full. If I'm archery hunting, it's going to look a little different than if I'm rifle hunting for elk versus if I'm rifle hunting for bears or whatever. So, All right. Mystery Ranch Metcalf. Been using them for years. Uh... If you want to save some money on one, go to GoHunt.com and buy your Mystery Ranch Metcalf and use promo code Randy when you check out, and I think you get 10% off. So, Tripod, don't ever go anywhere without a tripod. This is a carbon fiber. You can get it at Loophole.com. And then I'll just start here, go through here, and then we'll. I don't even know what's in half this stuff, so if, uh, if I mess something up, it's... Oh, yeah. yeah. You guys are going to think this is the bottomless pack, right? All right. The, the first level here, I have a bunch of extra straps because sometimes we strap stuff to the outside of our pack. So having cheater straps, and if you break a buckle, nice to have a, an extra buckle. Electrician's tape, don't leave home without it. Headlamp for me. Headlamp for the camera guy who always forgets his, his headlamp. Gerber center drive, fixed cameras, tripods, bows, all kinds of stuff. Hopefully you don't get to where you need your inReach, but if you do, you have it. Uh, this to charge because this is what we run our OnX applications on. Uh, we're gonna, someone asked a question, we're gonna cover this, so. This is a battery pack. We can recharge GoPros. We can recharge this. This will charge a cell phone so many times that it's crazy. Oh, little dry sack. You never know when you're going to need it. If it's raining or snowing, dry pair of socks. Uh, if it is raining or snowing, I'm worried about my phone. Then I have a dry bag to put that in there. This is my kind of office in the woods. So here are all my Montana tags, bear tags, everything else. Some states require your hunter ed certificates, even as old as I am. Looks like I'm uh, doubling down on the CDS stuff. Oh, uh, some extra diaphragm calls, wind charts for everybody who might carry a rifle with us. Uh, Zip ties, lens pen, and a regular pen because in most states you have to sign your tag once you draw, or once you punch your tag, you have to sign it. So that's what goes in this little pouch here. And I know once an animal's down, I'm gonna have all my tags and licenses right in here. It never leaves my pack easy to find you just kind of mentally know all right yep i got it all in there so i'm just going to put a bunch of this stuff to the side for right now go to pouch number two. Oh, tp right wrap your tp in a bag because if your tp gets wet it doesn't work very good so put it in a bag uh sleeve of ammo Never know when we're gonna, this is a little Gerber complete eating tool. Uh, hand warmers for either boots, hands, or batteries. Uh, I'm really into learning first aid more and more. Uh, uh, Adventure Medical Kits has this little first aid kit. I've been reading a lot of it. Uh, AA batteries and at least enough Snicker bar for breakfast. Um, I, my crew knows that Snickers and I get along really well. 
Uh, sunglasses. Uh, these are the new Leupold Made in America sunglasses. Um, you never know when you're going to want sunglasses, right? You go when it's really bright out. How many days in the snow and other stuff do you say? Yeah, I wish that I had something to block the sun. So now inside here, no, I, oh, yeah. I'm a big fan of water bladders. This one's been draining. Uh, you get those little tablets you put in there and you clean them out at the end of season, right? If you don't clean them out, expect to have something worse than Giardia. Uh, this one here is a platypus big zip lip, three liter. Um, I use platypus. I have yet to break a platypus. I've broke every other brand that's out there. Uh, depends on the weather forecast, Mr. Ranch here, this is a pack cover. If it's raining and your pack gets soaked and all the stuff in it, you'll wish you had that. Um, game bags, uh, yeah, you want game bags? Uh, those are from, a lot of you ask about the synthetic game bags that I use, caribou game bags, that's where I get them. Uh, so the pack is now empty. This here has a lot of important stuff in it. I like to keep it organized. I don't like stuff floating all over in my pack. Uh, first aid kit, adventure medical kit. They make all different sizes. This is the Sportsman 100. Uh, it's got everything I'm gonna need in there. But if we have a really bad tragedy back there, uh, adventure medical kits also makes quick clot. Um, carry a little bit of that, hope I never need it. Um, Oh yeah, you'll get a kick out of this, right? You always see me wearing these nitro gloves. And the reason I do that is I've skinned enough animals hunting and trapping to know that if you want to get some sort of infection, disease, whatever, have an open cut and be inside an animal, sooner or later you're going to get it. They don't weigh anything. <clears throat> Benadryl? I'm, uh, I'm allergic to deer, elk, and antelope hair and blood. So when I shoot an animal, First thing I do is I start popping those because I know if I don't, I'm going to not have a good day. Uh, let's see, space blanket or emergency blanket. Uh, in here is emergency stuff for fire starting, more than I would ever need. Here's some old trioxane, the, the stuff you can get at the military uh, surplus store. Uh, Stay Outside Longer has this little starter kit if you want it. It's got little starter pieces in there and it's got a flint and a striker. Um, I carry two lighters, right? I carry two headlamps, I carry two lighters. Some of you are probably saying, Newberg, sure you don't carry two packs? Uh, I carry a little bit of parachute cord. Uh, and then my knives. Ooh, that smells like a dead elk in there. Uh, these, I'm gonna show you the whole variety. What you've seen us use in the past are these Gerber this vital in the exchangeable blades there. Oh, that's why it smells. Woo! Wow. Man. And then you got the big game vital, right? And the exchangeable blades. And then coming out, you'll be able to get these the first week of June at Gerber.com. This is the Randy Newberg, we call it the DTS Dual Tool Series uh, from Gerber. The whole idea is that it's got a tool to do all your dirty work. This serrated edge right here for a hide, for bone, for the, the hocks, the knuckles, getting the atlas joint apart, all of that. You use this and then you don't damage your blade because when you're doing really, really tough stuff like bone and, and tendon and stuff, we call this a tendon tool. Uh, that takes the, age off, or the edge off your, your main cutting surface way quicker. So. Uh, that's the idea behind this one. And then, because I'm a really big fan of exchangeable blade knives, I didn't want a disposable blade knife, I wanted exchangeable blade. So, really lightweight. Uh, you can feel it's rubberized, ergonomic, ambidextrous. I guarantee you in the next two to three years, every knife company is going to copy this. See this? This is reflective tape. So that when you lay that down at night, you don't lose it. It, your headlamp hits it, it's like, oh, there it is, right? How many times have you laid your knife down at night and can't find it? Well, don't worry about that with these. They've got the prism tape that is reflective and it reflects back to wherever the light source is. 
Um, so this one has three blades and these are stout blades. You're not gonna break these blades. That was one of the things I required is you're not gonna break it. So you have different sizes of traditional blades. This is called the backstrap blade, a utility blade. And then there's this serrated blade. And some of you are gonna say, Randy, serrated blade. Well, the serrated blade, I've been using them for years and it serves the same purpose as this tendon tool. You use this to do all of the bad stuff, the things that would dull your traditional edge. And you just push this button, swap it out, and that allows you to preserve the edge on this. And when you get to the meat and the other important stuff, you got a super, super sharp edge. You can actually hand sharpen these. Uh, that was one of the deals. I wanted these to be resharpenable, um, but they're designed, uh, Gerber, with their treatment processes and the steel that they're using. They figure you can get about four elk with one of these before they need sharpening. And you don't have to throw them away. You can resharpen them. Um, they go in this nice little kit. And one of the things that always annoys me is when I have a rattling noise in my pack, I'm just, are you one of those people where when your truck has a rattle, you're like, what is that? Well, I didn't want this rattling so they put this baffle in there that pushes down and when everything's in there no noise so and then this stem goes right in this little case right here just like that so that's what's in my pack a lot of this stuff and you know, a lot of people are like man i didn't know you had relationships with all those companies no, a lot of these are, most of the stuff you saw me throw out here, I don't, I don't get paid anything from them. I just use it because it works. So if it works, I'm going to use it. That's kind of my, oh, don't go home. Don't, don't leave without, like this is a, a Gerber dime. You know when you're swapping out uh, tripod heads and plates and stuff? Really nice to have one of these. So... Oh, and then my, my friends at Caribou Game Bag, I forgot about this one. I have this hunter's tarp. Uh, you can use it as a tarp, but a lot of times I use it, I lay it down and I put meat on there to keep dirt and grass and weeds and stuff from getting on my meat. And then also, when you fold it out, if you want to put, you, you can wrap it around the game bag. If it's, say it's a, an animal you've just processed and it's a quarter, right? There's a lot of blood easing out of there. This will keep all the blood from getting inside your pack so all right let's clean up this mess how do i fit all that stuff in this pack no wonder i complain about how hard it is to walk up and down the mountain they got so much gear with me that it's crazy how are we doing all right what type and size of dry bags do i use this one here i would bet is maybe a liter so this is C to Summit. I don't know. I'm just, it was on sale. So I bought it. So, uh, let's see. Um, doo -doo. If I could buy just one knife, which one would I recommend? Hmm, boy, it depends on what kind of hunting you do and if weight is an issue. I would, uh, for backpack stuff, I would get the, uh, what we call EBS, the exchange blade system. If weight isn't a concern, you know, maybe go with the dual tool system. If you like a traditional folding knife, up to you. So, uh, how much does that pack usually weigh? <laughs> uh, by the time I put my spotter on there with the tripod, with some food, with, you know, three liters of water, three liters of water right there, six and a half pounds. I usually don't fill it all the way. Um, with that pack, it's at least pushing 30 pounds all the time. And... Our crew, you should see their packs. They're carrying spare batteries, spare audio, spare lenses. I mean, I... Oh, do you pack a puffy coat? And if so, what one? Yeah. Uh, last year, some of you are really, really observant. You're like, Randy, what's that new puffy coat you're wearing? Well, if you go to Sitka's website right now, they're talking about... I think next week they're going to actually launch it. So maybe I can't say what it was. It's a down puffy. It's a... So, um, anyhow, I'll let Sika announce it. 
next week. Let's see, <laughs> someone, <laughs> do you have a mattress in there too? <laughs> So, a lot of these questions got asked earlier on Instagram, Instagram Story, and Facebook. And then there's a bunch of them here. These guys over here are copying and pasting things onto it. We have a Google Doc right here that I'm working from. So, if I'm looking around like this, it's because I'm trying to read your question. And because this is called Elk Talk Live, one of the comments we got is, Hey, Randy. I tune in to listen to elk hunting questions. I don't care about jackrabbits or songbirds or fishing or whatever. So we're trying to sort them mostly to be the elk hunting questions. So if we didn't answer your question or get to your question, I apologize, but right here I have, let's see, eight pages of questions right in front of me right now. We're gonna get through eight pages of questions, guys. We'll try, huh? All right. Okay, so when you're in a remote location with zero cell coverage, what device do you rely on to view your Onyx maps? That's why I kept this up. The first thing you do when you leave the truck, well, even before you go out hunting, you download your maps to your device. And then you put this on airplane mode, right? That little airplane thing. And then you're able to do the maps without needing service. Your GPS works whether you're in range of service or not. So off you go, you hit on X right there. You see that it's loading. Choom, here I am, I'm off and running right there. And I have, I'm in airplane mode. Now, the reason we carry these is if we're out on a four or five day backpack hunt, we don't want these to die because we've got our waypoints on them, our tracks, our trail. So through this, you can charge that and charge all kinds of other stuff. So uh, we've covered this before. There's really good tutorials out on the Onyx site if, uh, if you want to go watch them. Oh, uh, let's see, boy, there are so many of them. Um, <laughs> this one's kind of funny. So uh, <laughs> hopefully my wife isn't watching. Uh, Randy, how many death glares do you get from your wife since you've been under quarantine? Below average, average, above average? Uh, probably above average. Uh, yeah, she's not accustomed to me being under her feet all the time. Uh, so, oh well. Uh, this one, Brian asks, what determines one area to be better than another for a sanctuary? Well, if you go watch all of our videos about e-scouting for elk. We talk about sanctuaries. Sanctuaries are either distance or topography. And what I mean is how much distance or how much topography between the hunting pressure and the sanctuary. So if the, you can't say they're all uh, sanctuaries of equal value because there might be some rough country, but you can drive right up to it and look down in it. That's not gonna be that much of a sanctuary. Now, if it's a sanctuary where you have to hike up, say, 500 feet of vertical, really bad, nasty, right from the trailhead, usually that's going to thin people out. They're going to be like, heck with that. Uh, or some people just, they don't want to haul an elk for four miles. And so four miles of flat going, uh, you got them all thinned out. So uh, it's really hard to say which is better than the other. And we talk about sanctuaries in the two, the last two periods of the elk calendar, the post rut and the late season. That's the time we worry about sanctuaries. Don't be worrying about sanctuaries as much when we're talking peak rut, post or pre rut, early season pre rut or peak rut. They don't really care that much about sanctuaries at that time. So um, you're just gonna have to look at it and see, all right, if I was an elk and I wanted to get away from hunting pressure, where are the roads? Where's the motorized trails? What either in terms of distance or topography gives elk comfort to go there? And the odds are if you walk over there and look in a canyon or you look up this steep face and you say, well, I don't wanna do that. The odds are you found a sanctuary and it might be blow down. Sanctuaries can also be boundary areas boundaries between units because this unit is closed this unit is open you know 
Nobody, no one wants to go hunt boundaries. This might be pro public, this might be private. Well, everyone likes to leave a big buffer. I don't want to go mess with that private. Well, there's sanctuary areas there. There's all kinds of areas that constitute a sanctuary that may not just be distance or topography. So, oh, this one. I wish I would, so I'm 55. I, what's, there's a song that says, I wish I'd known now what I didn't know then or something like that. Sounds like a Toby Keith song or something, but anyhow, uh, I wish I knew then what I know now, and I don't. I still don't know that much. Uh, but this question is: If you could rewind 30 years prior, what would you have done differently as a new or young hunter? This is Stephen asking this question. Would you change your perception a little? Would you have enjoyed different aspects of just what is the biggest thing you would have learned? First thing I would have done is got rid of all the gadgets, all the gizmos, all the doodads, and I would have went and bought the book Elk and Elk Ecology, and I would have read it start to finish, and then I would have read it start to finish, and then I would have read it again. Because the thing where I was, if there's a pivot point of where I went from just struggling, not finding elk, not finding elk, not finding elk, to all of a sudden approaching it and thinking about it in a, in a real uh, structured manner was when I decided I'm going to learn everything I can about elk, their needs, their habits, their behaviors, what are they going to do when this happens, where are they going to be this time of year, what's their food needs, what's their water needs, across all different kinds of landscapes. And the reason I decided to do that was I wasn't finding elk. I'd go three or four days and not see an elk. I'm like, ah. Yeah, right here. This book right here. Yeah, you see how thick that is? And it doesn't come in an audible version. But there are lots of pictures if that counts. Read this. You can get it at the Wildlife Management Institute. Uh, since I started telling everybody to get this book, I don't know how many reprintings they've done. I don't know if it's because I always talk about it. Uh, but someone emailed me yesterday and said, hey, they're out of the book. Where can I get it other than paying $400 on Amazon? Call the Wildlife Management Institute, I think they're in Virginia. And this book right here is the, the it's, it's just really, really good. Um, I don't know how many times I've, I've read it. Uh, yeah, right here it says it was 85 bucks. Um, I probably, I wish I would have found it earlier. So back to that question. Uh, Jack Ward Thomas was who started this book and then he's had some authors after he passed away or even just before he passed away who jumped in and helped him but this book will answer so many questions about what elk do. I mean in here it will tell you where elk prefer to bed, how steep a slope, how far down the hillside. Do they like to bed in the upper part, the lower part, the middle part? I mean there's so much information in there it's crazy. I'll never understand it all. But back to this question of what would I have done 30 years ago? I don't know when the first edition of this book came out. I think it came out in 95. So I was already into my, my time of struggling and floundering in elk hunting. And then this book came out and I bought it and I read it and I read it and I read it and read it. And the point of that is learn as much about elk as you can. There's no substitute for knowing about elk because it's this simple. Elk are not out on the landscape by random. They are at some place on the landscape on purpose for the food, for the water, for the security, for the risk related to predation and other stuff. They can't afford to just randomly like, oh yeah, man. I mean, these aren't 15 year old young guys hanging out at the pool or something. I mean, elk have to live a life with a purpose. So you need to understand what is their purpose for being where they are at the time of year you're going to hunt them. And that all comes down to what their needs are. They have four primary needs, three permanent, one seasonal. Food, water, security, or, or sanctuary. And the seasonal one is breeding. It's that simple, right? Just how it is. So once you know where they're going to go on the landscape to satisfy that need, that's where you're going to find them. I wish I would have figured that out 30 years ago. Uh, I still don't have it figured out, but 
it sure makes it a whole lot easier to find out consistently. If you don't find them, you can't kill them. That's how I tell people, you know, first step to killing an elk is find an elk. And once I, uh, my theory is at least in rifle season, once you find an elk, they're one of the easier critters to set up a strategy and go and, and close the deal. Uh, archery, a little bit more difficult, but uh, still, the more you find, the more you're gonna be able to have encounters and the greater the likelihood you're gonna end up filling your tag. Um, Oh, uh, yeah, I know, Greg, the book is out of stock. Keep calling them, keep emailing them at the Wildlife Management Institute, and I suspect that they will probably get it back in stock. Um, if not, I'll call them. I know some people there and say, hey, you guys are letting me down. Uh, oh, this one. This, t this is also, it took a long time to come to this, but I think that one of the things that helped me with this part of elk hunting is I've always been below average at everything. Nothing ever came easy to me except BSing and storytelling. That was about the only skill that I really just felt like I had naturally. So Josh says, I'd be interested in hearing about how you deal with the mental aspect of hunting. Though we love it, the hunt is lit littered with obstacles that wear you down mess up your focus, your desire, and your joy. What do you do to prepare for the mental challenges of hunting the backcountry? And what steps do you take when your attitude takes a turn to the south? Well, you, th that's such a good question because it is so mental. It is so easy to give up. The first step is have a plan. If you don't have a plan, you leave the truck the first morning kind of hoping for some luck or just some random encounter and it doesn't work out and after that you really don't have a plan to follow of okay I said I was going to do this the first morning I was going to do this the next afternoon if those didn't work I was going to do this the second morning so you have this plan laid out that's why e-scouting gives me so much confidence when I'm out in the hill even if day one I don't see any elk day two I don't see any elk day three I know I'm probably getting closer and closer because I'm just eliminating more and more of the ground where they're not. And I'm getting closer and closer to where they are. So mentally, having a plan really helps with the mental aspects of frustration, uh, just kind of hope, you know, you're like, oh, gee, here we go again. Um, and then the other part of it is, if, if your mental makeup is that you look for the easy path or the shortcut, or the get rich quick kind of idea, you're not gonna be a very good public land elk hunter. You, you have to build that mental determination that you just don't give up. To me, I, and I tell this story uh, when I have more time, is I gave up on one thing in my life when I was 18 years old, and I regretted it. The day I gave up, I regretted it, and I said, never again am I gonna quit, never. And I don't, and my, I'm sure my crew is like, Come on, Randy, it, you know, we can, the elk got away. We can give up now. Nope, I'm not giving up. Uh, so, and as far as bringing the desire and the joy back into it on those hard days, all I do is just think about, you know what? I'm so blessed to live in the United States. I'm so blessed to have all this public land. Well, how could I not be having a good time today? And sometimes it just requires the reset button. Uh, and maybe you got to have this, you know, idea in your head that, or, or this m mental reminder. Uh, for me, I always wear this bracelet, uh, and this is something really personal to me, but uh, my friend Ray White, who is a EOD guy over in Afghanistan, uh, he made this out of his EOD explosive ordnance disposal kit. Uh, and I look down at it and I think about it, and the black stands for the people who didn't come home. The red is for the people who were wounded and got to come home. And the green is for the people still serving. So whenever I look at that, it's pretty easy to remind me of how damn lucky I am. And I don't care if the biggest elk in the world just got away from me. I live in the United States. I get to hunt public land. I, that, I'll never not wear that. And it serves as a reminder for a lot of things in my life when I maybe want to complain or snivel because I'm being a wuss. I mean, let's face it, we're humans. Sometimes we're kind of 
wusses. We get soft. If we wanted to, you know, right? If you think about in today's world how soft we are. My grandmother's family, when they homesteaded in northern Minnesota, the first winter in 19, I think it was um, 14 or something, they lived in a tent all winter in northern Minnesota. Everything in my family since then, we've been a bunch of candy asses. So, and I don't even worry about any of that stuff. I'm here having fun, and if I get one, I get one. So, but it is all mental. That, that's, that was a big, long gyration about how the mental part of elk hunting can really get you down. Uh, and I just had to develop ways to get through that and to think about, all right, what makes... What, what is it that makes me understand how lucky I am? And then I'm off to the next thing. So, what is all of the questions about mayo and miracle whip? Where did that start from? What are you guys talking about, man? Are these guys spamming us, or do they know that I hate mayonnaise and miracle whip? In my family, we call it pucky. P-U-C-K-Y, pucky. I don't do pucky. I don't do mayo. I don't do Miracle Whip. I don't do ketchup. I don't do ranch dressing. I don't do mustard. And if you work for me and you spill your mustard in my cooler, you're fired. That's one of the first things the camera guy gets told here. Because I don't do pucky, okay? I have bread, I have meat, and I have cheese. Why would I want to ruin all of those great flavors by putting mayo or... Yeah, I don't know how you guys... Where did those questions come from? But, no, oh well. I have nothing to do with elk hunting. Uh, I guess it has to do with how quirky I am. But. Uh, let's see. Oh, don't forget that the Nevada... We're, we're already through most of the drawing deadlines. Nevada, May 4th deadline. Oregon, May 15th, Idaho, June 5th. Those are the only remaining limited entry or controlled hunt deadlines still there. Normally, we do this every week during application season, and we talk about the Go Hunt Insider and all that. And Well, there's only three states left. Uh, if you did apply in Wyoming before the January 31st deadline, you have, I think, until May 8th. Yeah, May 8th to go in and adjust or alter or change your application. And then... Once all the draws are done, we will get back into the over-the-counter options. Idaho, Colorado, Utah, maybe some leftovers in Montana, maybe some cow elk tags in other places. But uh, there's, there's places to go hunting every year. Um, did I draw New Mexico? Nope, I didn't. Uh, Kelton? I would, I'm reading your comment here, so your camera guys should prank you and spill some mayo or mustard in your cooler. Nope, that would not be a good idea. I have zero humor about it. Zero, none. My brother and I just about got in fist fights about five years ago. He was trying to make me eat some walleye that he had dipped in some honey mustard. Oh, man, yeah. How did we get on this topic? Delete all the mayo and pucky comments. It, it's distracting to me. Uh, let me get to some more questions here. I shouldn't be so distracted. I'm sorry. I'm out of practice. Uh, let's see. Hmm. How do you know what elk are eating at certain periods of the year? Are there any specific grasses or plants you are looking for? So that's a good question. Uh, it depends on which state, what elevation, what habitat types, what soil types, what time of the year. Uh, elk are very opportunistic grazers, and they will pick, they can make a living off so many things in the landscape. That's why they're so adaptable. But if you want to know the answer to that, here it is. It's in here, but there's so many possibilities in here. What you need to do is find out what is it in the unit you're going to be hunting. Because what they prefer to eat in the grasslands of Montana are completely different than what they want to eat in the dark timber of Idaho or the sage of Wyoming or the aspens of Colorado or the juniper of Arizona. So you got to think about, all right, where am I hunting? 
what are the food sources across the landscape and talk to range scientists. Just about every university in the state you're going to be hunting has done a lot of studies in their either their ag school, uh, the BLM, the state land uh, grazing managers, the Forest Service. If you go out and Google uh, elk forage, Apache Sitgreaves National Forest, all kinds of reports are going to come up. Read them and it will tell you what the preferred elk forage is. And then you got to figure out how to identify that so I can know where it's when I see it. Oh, that's what it is. That's Cliffs Rose or that's Grandma Grass or that's whatever. You got it. It's not, there's not just this, oh, here's, here it is, problem solved. It's multiple, multiple variables and it just requires the homework to know it. But once you figure out what their preferred, preferred, <laughs> preferred food source is in the area you're hunting at the time you're hunting, you're going to find a lot more elk. So, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> let's see, I'm trying to sort through here for all of the uh, questions related to elk hunting. Someone keeps asking the same question, Randy, why don't you hunt wolves? Obviously they don't follow my content very much. Uh, I shot a wolf in November. Uh, we aired the first wolf episode in 2013, it was. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, we'll poster up bulls bugle. Yep, they sure will. Um, they're not going to bugle a lot, but they sure will. Uh, I don't use bugling and calling that much as a post rut tactic. Um, would, so would someone delete that guy who keeps asking that same question? I, I just... <laughs> Uh, you know, if you're going to spam my platforms, I, I did a live the other day, just randomly. And some guy was out on there hacking on everybody who asked a question. And I'm like, hey, dude, I'm going to toast you. So if you come to our platforms to engage, we're here to have fun. So don't show up here and be a jerk because we get rid of you. So anyhow, you guys got better things to do. If, if you guys wanted to go and and have somebody ragging on you about something you didn't like, you'd go, go, you'd turn on Facebook or the news or something. You come here, we're going to have fun, laugh, chuckle, I'm going to make a fool of myself. So, if you're asking questions or you're interacting with people on the thread and you're being a jerk, you'll be gone. So, uh, Chad asks, how do you control your scent on an archery elk backcountry hunt? Do you put your clothes near a fire, pine, or other? Uh, you really don't. You know, there's no way you're going to control your scent. If you get upwind of an elk, the gig's up, no matter what you've done with your clothes. So it's all about knowing wind, knowing thermals, knowing how those patterns change throughout the day, the seasonal part of it of, you know, maybe and you, you might be out somewhere and it's a prevailing west for the summertime and it becomes more of a prevailing northwest in hunting season. I mean, there, there's so many different things about wind, but thermals, we've done a video about thermals. That's probably the biggest thing that you have to understand. And uh, I don't do anything with my clothes as well. I, I sweat in them and stink them up, it seems like. But I, when you're in the back country, there's just nothing that you could do about it. Uh, Cindy asks, uh, my other half, Chance, drew a non-resident elk tag in Montana. He's super excited, but he's also super nervous. Uh, neither of us have ever hunted elk. Uh, he's going with a buddy uh, who's hunted elk. But my question is, what's the best tidbit advice you can offer to a 48-year-old first-time elk hunter to calm his nerves? Have fun. Don't worry about it. Just... Do as much research as you can. Get in as best shape as you possibly can and come out here and understand that this is about having fun. Give it your best effort. If you research, if you put together an e-scouting plan or a, a plan before you get here and you start working that plan, over time, you're, you're probably going to encounter some elk. And if you struggle to find elk the first time, think about that as an investment in the next time. And that's what I love about states that are easier to draw or that are over the counter. You can go to the same spot year after year after year and after three or four seasons, you almost know it as good as some of the locals. I mean, you're spending a week there or so 
every year at the time the elk season is open. You're learning where they're at. So uh, don't stress out about it. Have fun. It's your elk hunting, right? You could be at the office or you could be at, you know, at the job site or whatever it is that you do for work. Uh, elk hunting is going to be a whole lot more fun than that and probably going to have fun. Uh, Dave asks, what are some good questions to ask a biologist if you're able to when you're e-scouting and planning your hunt in a new area? Uh, my, my answer always is do your homework before you ever call a biologist or a range scientist or anything like that. The, the last thing, so here's how it works a lot of times. Hello, sir. Can you tell me where to kill an elk in unit 314? And they get that question 300 times after the drawing comes out. And he probably tells everybody the same answer. Yeah, go to Birch Creek. So you show up and everybody's at Birch Creek. And he's, he's thinking to himself, or she's thinking to herself, you know what, if that person isn't going to put any more in, interest and effort in it, then to just ask me where to kill an elk, I'm going to send them all to the same place. I'm being a little bit facetious there, but put yourself in their shoes. The drawing comes out and they get 500 phone calls. How would you like to have to get your daily work done and try to answer 500 phone calls of people who ask really vague questions? Now, if they get a call from someone who says, you know, I've been looking over my maps. It looks to me like the winter range is here and the summer range is there. If you get weather, will those elk use this corridor over here by Willow Creek and over on that BLM section? And is there a lot of hunting pressure there? And they'll appreciate that you've done a bunch of research of your own and you're just asking more for confirmation of some of your ideas. And they'll probably say, yeah, that's a pretty good spot. And oh, by the way, sometimes they'll come around this way, so don't forget about that. So my point of using that as, a, as an example is the better you show up with being informed and having researched, the better answers you're going to get from these people who they're, they're overwhelmed with questions. So, uh, as far as what questions to ask, I'm always interested in questions related to the need that the elk will have at that time of year. So, if the primary need is sanctuary, I'm going to be asking them questions about what's the hunting pressure like? Where does the hunting pressure come from? Is this road open? Is this trail motorized or non-motorized? Da, da, da. Because that's going to determine if elk go in there to find security and sanctuary. Now, if it's a food pattern, say I'm hunting cow elk. And they're always on food, 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 and more food. All right. So summer range is up here, winter range is down there. I'm going to be asking them questions. Hey, you know, I'm going to be there in late October. They're probably not on the winter range. They're probably somewhere in here. Is what's the main food source there? Is it some sort of grasses? Is it you know whatever it might be in that area? Maybe it's dried junipers, or maybe it's. Uh, what, what, I mean, the stuff I've seen elk is crazy. Elk eat is crazy. But I'm going to be asking that person, all right, what are the food types? So I think through my mind, what's the need the elk have that I'm going to use to find them? And all my questions are going to be driven kind of under that umbrella of whatever that need is. So, oh, S. Vibs asks, in your opinion, I'm glad you asked my opinion because most everything you get from me is opinion, not fact. Uh, what is the best unit in Wyoming to apply for with five points if you're an archery hunter? If you want to make sure you're going to draw and you're an archery hunter in Wyoming, the general tag. You have so many units, it's really good hunting. Wyoming doesn't have much in the way of bad units. You can move around a lot. Uh, you got all of September from the 1st to the 30th. So I would say, yeah, the general tag. Uh, let's see. Someone says, what's your favorite unit in Nevada for a bull elk? I'm sitting on nine points and archery is my first option. There are no bad units in Nevada. None. Just it, what I do. Here, here's what I did. I did my Nevada application. I go to Go Hunt, go to the Insider, click on the draw odds for Nevada for elk and you can do it by archery or rifle or whatever and in Nevada you get five choices right so I make my first choice a really hard one and I make my last few choices the easiest ones well I want those last ones so they're probably going to be archery hunts 
And I'm just going, all right, easiest to draw, second easiest to draw, third easiest to draw. I, that's how I do it in Nevada. Because there are no bad hunts for elk in Nevada. Um, so, how bad are grizzly bears in Montana? I'm a first time non-resident elk hunter here. Well, if you go to Northwest Montana, anything from the Rocky Mountain front to the west, you, you're gonna be dealing with grizzly bears. Anything pretty much north of I-90 from Missoula to the Idaho border. In Southwest Montana, anything south of I-90 from Billings to Bozeman to Butte, better have your head on a swivel. You're probably gonna be dealing with elk density or uh, grizzly bear densities that are higher than a lot of other places. I, I'd say the only place with a higher grizzly bear density than some of those places I just rattled off would probably be Northwest Wyoming. Northwest Wyoming has crazy grizzly bear densities. We have really high densities, but not like there. So keep a clean camp, follow all the bear aware stuff. I mean, it's out there, all the things you gotta do in grizzly country to, to stay safe um, and go have fun. The best elk hunting is also in grizzly bear country. Um, is it possible for someone from Sweden to hunt elk in the United States? Yep, you're treated like a non-resident, just like if you applied in Wyoming, you being from Sweden, me from Montana, we'd both be looked at the same in a place like Wyoming or whatever state it is, so. Um, any chance you would do a play-by-play -play video on previous elk episodes and explain what your tactics were and what tactics worked and didn't work? That's what you guys are trying to get me to do, isn't it? You guys have been hounding me now. Yeah, that's exactly what we're saying. So, so, any chance? Yeah, these guys, now that the COVID-19 stuff is starting to relax, there's a pretty good chance that we're going to start doing some of those. So uh let's see unit uh, no we don't talk about units i'm sorry about that um we uh uh i hope people understand when they say can you tell me where i should apply or this unit or that unit the last thing we're going to do is give you a unit or a drainage or whatever we might say general things like central wyoming or you know Eastern Montana or Western Colorado or Northern Arizona. We're not going to say, oh, unit two in this area because then other people start focusing on it. And for those who are already applying there or hunting there, we don't want to create more headache for them. People already look at our video and they're always trying to, oh, where are they at? Where are they at? And here's kind of how it works. If someone hunts there, they recognize some of the shots in the video and they panic. They're like, oh no, he's in my spot. Well, all of the rest of the viewers who've never been to that spot, they have no idea where it is. We try our best to balance, you know, how, how do people know or not know where we're at? And there's so many tools people have access to where they can't, if they really want to, they're going to figure out where we're at. The last thing we're going to do is complicate that by being blatant and saying, oh yeah, we're in unit, you know, there's been a couple times we've had really, really bad hunts and we told people, you know what, we're in this unit, <clears throat> think twice before you apply here. <laughs> we have done that a time or two. Uh, let's see. Is it worth buying a bear tag while chasing deer and elk in Montana? I think so, but, uh, Fall bear hunting is very, very under, underrated, yeah, overlooked uh, in Montana. And uh, that's, that's really a, a fun hunt in the fall. And uh, most of us who are residents were so absorbed with the deer and elk hunting, we overlooked the bear hunting, but it's definitely possible. Uh, how tough is Wyoming in general for elk? Well, uh, they have some of the highest harvest rates in the West. Uh, their bull to cow ratios are good. Their cow to calf ratios are good. Uh, I would say if you have a Wyoming elk tag, uh, you're probably sitting on a really good tag. There aren't many bad tags in Wyoming. Uh, I found one last year, but that was just because there was really no access. Um, 
Oh, let's see. Randy, do you think that the Forest Service's fire suppression policies are forcing more elk onto private land instead of public? Do you feel they should let more wildfires burn? Uh, there's so many benefits in fire, right? We, we know that fire improves the habitat. There's always that balance of, all right, <clears throat> do we let a wildfire burn? Or if we do, how big? They're try, they try to control them. They, may, they call them, you know, managed burns is a term that I've heard used at times. And they're trying to let some of them burn because they're having a hard time having controlled burns and all the liability that comes with that. But I don't want to say just because of burns, but uh, there is definitely a reason why, I'll, I'll use this, okay? My phone is public land and the charger is private land. If the phone, this public land, is three square miles of marginal habitat because there's not been any fire, it's nothing but old dying timber, there's no feed there, and then this private land is actively managed. They do some burns there, they do some weed spraying and control, they do some forest thinning so the canopy grows all these grass, or er, is broken, and it grows all these grasses. If you're an elk, regardless of hunting pressure, where are you going to live? you're gonna go over here. So one of the critical things we have to focus on to get more elk on public land is to manage the public land better. It's not the private landowner's fault that he, ha he or she has better habitat. It's our responsibility to up our game and make our habitat on the public land something that the elk is interested in. We used to have a lot of active management going on on landscapes, whether it was fire, whether it was thinning, logging, whatever. You know, people want to say, oh, that logging was da da da. They don't do that kind of clear cut stuff anymore. Logging is done way differently. But if you think about, there used to be summer range, winter range, transition range. Elk used to take their time getting from the summer range to the winter range because there was a lot of valuable habitat, mostly feed and other stuff, in these transition ranges. As the transition ranges have become nothing but old forests, dark timber, the elk leave the summer range, they go through that dark timber and they're down here on the winter range, which is very often highly productive private land. They, they aren't on the public land much anymore. And some people will say, oh, the landowner is harboring the elk or da da da. No, the landowner is usually just managing their property well. And our public lands, due to lawsuits, due to all kinds of other stuff, isn't getting managed as well. So the elk make a conscious decision of where they want to be. I mean, if Randy Newber's driving down the road and there's a Taco Bell over here or a Dairy Queen over there, I'm going Dairy Queen. That's kind of what the elk is faced with. Nothing against Taco Bell. I don't eat there, but you know, maybe if you like tacos, maybe that's where you'd go. But you know, people are going to want to go get the blizzard. That's what the elk is saying. He's walking around. He's like, man, there's like Dairy Queen over here. So that's where he goes. It's. I'm trying to be a little bit humorous about it and joke about it. But it's really not a joking matter. Matter. Part of the reason we get frustrated with public lands, uh, as far as the public-private interface, is yep, the elk all end up on private. Not all, but a lot. Why? Because of so many things: lawsuits, budget cuts, everything else. The Forest Service is wanting to do all these projects that would improve the habitat, or the BLM wants to do all these projects, but they can't do them. And so eventually, the habitat gets old and and not of much value, and the elk just go boom, right to private. So that's an awful long answer to that question, but it was a really good question. That's why I spend so, nice, so much time talking about it. Um, what else we got? I wonder, uh, let's see. I'm focusing on the elk questions here. Um, why does everyone want to know what truck we bought? or I bought. I just scratched a great big check for a, a 2019 Ford Raptor and we were going to do a big bunch of videos on it but with the whole COVID thing it just seemed pretty indulgent pretty uh, I don't know it just didn't seem like the right thing to be talking about so we scrapped all those videos uh, but hey I uh, 
had bought five Nissan Titans out of my own pocket. Nissan had sent me a Titan to use for two years and beat it up and give feedback. And then when that deal was done, I said, well, time to go check them all out again. And uh, I found a used Ford Raptor with 900 miles that was a deal of the century. And so that's what I bought. Um, let's see, we're getting some llama questions here. Llamas. If you want to have better elk hunting, call my buddy Bo Beatty at Wilderness Ridge Trail Llamas and rent some llamas for elk season. I can assure you life will be really, really good after that. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Do I expect more over-the-counter opportunities because of the cor coronavirus and the economy? Mm, I don't know. I that's, never really thought about that. I, I, I don't know. That's probably a question that we're going to find out sooner or later. Um, and let's see. <laughs> How many Yeti coolers do you need for an elk? Uh, I get asked that a lot. And for me, I usually take two 65 quarts and a 75 quart, depending on if I'm, I, I'm gonna bone it out really good. How hot is it gonna be? If I gotta do a ton of ice, I'm bringing four coolers. And it's a mix and match between 65s and 75s. I'd prefer two 65s and two 75s. Uh, but I want to leave enough space in there if it's really warm that I can get a lot of ice on top of it. And I put the ice on top because cold air drops. Obviously, I want to make sure that when I put the meat in there, it's already cool. Uh, but so it's more a function of total volume than it is number of coolers. But they're kind of related, right? Uh, Becca Bard says, how do thermals work? Uh, on this YouTube channel, if you Google thermals, we did a video about them. I think we're going to probably do some more just because it's, uh, it's a common, common question. And uh, we're, we're going to do, do more about it if people have that many questions about it. Is Uncle Larry coming hunting again this year? <laughs> uh, we hope so, if he draws a tag. Uh, those of you saw him shoot the wrong elk in Wyoming last year. Uh, that was hilarious. And I don't know if you saw the, uh, the outtake that we did with him and his colorful language, but that's out on our YouTube channel. Uh, oh, season eight of Amazon is starting to roll out. I think we've got five or six episodes on Amazon Prime. So if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, Go out there. Uh, it's, it's ready. It's, we're dropping episodes now. Um, if you want to stay uh, up to date on when we're doing this, we're going to try to do it every Wednesday, but sometimes we're traveling, so we got to do it a different time. You can get a reminder by texting Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to 64600. Um, and let's see, a few more questions here. Uh, on X Maps. Dot com. Use promo code Randy, save 20%. GoHunt.com. Sign up for the Insider. Use Randy. Get $50 of money back. GerberGear.com. Use promo code Randy, save 20%. Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. Use promo code Randy, save 15%. Um, so, all those places. And don't forget about Leupold and Botech. Oh, oh. Someone, is, is, someone just put this up. Where did I see that? Someone... I just saw a question scroll through here. You guys, the questions come so fast, I can't do them all. RJ, our office manager, said, Randy, make sure people know that the t-shirts are on sale. If you use promo code Randy, you get 10% off. So public land, hunt like you own it, right? That's one of them. We got another public land, hunt like you own it. Right here. That one, that looks better than my face. And then you got the Kim Newberg special. If you hook them, you cook them. My wife is not a catch and release person, in case anyone's wondering. And this is our top seller, Big Hank, right? You guys hear us always talking about, oh, we're looking for Big Hank. Um, so go to shoprandynewberg.com and use promo code Randy and you get 10% off. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, yeah. Do you have your moose, goat, and sheep applications in in Montana? Don't forget about that. Tomorrow, I think, is the deadline. Or May 1st. Tomorrow's the 30th, so do it tomorrow. That way you, that way you know you've got it made. 
let's see. Uh, new Yeti sponsorship these days? Nope. Um, just using their product. Um, our prior cooler company. A lot of people, eh, this, this cracks me up. We do a video in my shop and everyone's like, oh, look at all those Yeti coolers in there. Well, the, our cooler company we used to use got out of the hunting space. It's like, okay, you know, if you're not in the hunting space, I'm not the guy for you because I'm in the hunting space. And I know the guys at Yeti, and they heard the story about how it happened, and they're like, really? Can we send you some coolers? I'm like, yeah, go ahead. Send them to me. So they sent me this. Well, they didn't send me this cup. My buddy Dustin sent me this cup. But So, no, I don't have a deal with Yeti. I might someday, but right now I'm just using their coolers. Um, all right, Fernando, I'm going to answer your question. So you got an elk tag late season Arizona. Any advice? Uh, go there early, scout. They're in a late season mode. They're going to be far from roads and trails, all sanctuary, sanctuary, sanctuary. Um, and good luck. So, uh, let's see. From I'm from Pennsylvania. Which western states are the easiest to do a public land at elk hunt on your own? Um, well, if drawing a tag is is something you don't want to deal with then you're left with the over-the-counter options of colorado and idaho and those are easy i mean they have each of them have 25 to 30 million acres of public land so there's tons of places to go there's tons of resources out there and you can just get a tag over the counter if you want to start building some points in some of these states and eventually draw a limited entry tag uh, i would probably look at arizona colorado wyoming That'd be the ones I'd, I'd look at. Um, do I have a promo code for black gold archery sites? I don't. I'm sorry. Um, but I do use black gold sites. They're great, great stuff. Uh, yeah. I, 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 don't, I think about all the gear I use. It is so much more capable than I am. It's not even in the question. I, I'm always such a weak link. Uh, it's... <laughs> I can't believe that I'm, uh, why, why any of these companies even trust me, I guess, is, is why I'm scratching my head and stumbling here. Uh, let's see, southeast Alaska bear hunting this year? Nope. Uh, we drew tags, me and my, ni my niece, Jordan, we were supposed to go to Alaska in three weeks, but as many of you know, with COVID-19, Alaska closed non-resident bear hunting this spring. No luck with that. But uh, here's something I'd like to know from all of you. We're trying to figure out how we go bear hunting here in Montana. Season is open. Jonathan over here has been out. He's seen two bears already this year. But I'm going to have to film myself because I can't have a whole crew jump in my truck and stay six feet away. And by the time we pay for film permits and pay for everything else for us to drive a separate vehicle, it just doesn't make sense. So, if I went out and filmed myself with a GoPro and a handy cam, would anyone watch it? I guess is the question I'm asking. Because if no one's going to watch it because I'm so bad, heck, I'll just go up there and leave the camera at home. I'll just go bear hunting. I'll maybe put a picture out here or something. Uh, I'd be curious to know if uh, if you guys are, where, where are you at in your desire for content right now? Would you put up with Randy's really, really bad filming and corny editing jokes and style just to have some content? Or do you want us to just say, Randy, don't, don't mess with him, man. Don't, don't, don't waste our time. I, I don't know what you'd want to do. Uh, but I know one thing. I have, so, if people don't know this. We have some episodes that I've self-filmed, and I don't know if people even knew it when I self-filmed them. They probably did because they're like, man, that's some crappy footage, Newberg. You need to get some better people. Uh, let's see. Been looking forward to some day-to-day -day bear hunts for this year. Post anything you have. Well, thanks, Owen. That's, uh, that's the kind of feedback we were wanting. Oh, <laughs> someone says, well, we put up with your muskrat videos. <laughs> <laughs> that whole muskrat series I filmed all by myself. So, uh, well, I guess, guess I'm going bear hunting next week. 
get my GoPro and my handy cam ready. The only thing, here's the only other part of it, is we have to get public land film permits. And right now, the Forest Service, I mean, they're dealing with the same thing we are. So for them to get us public land film permits is, uh, is more of a challenge right now. It's, it's hard for them. They, they aren't in their offices or, uh, so, and those are pretty complicated processes. So I don't know what we're gonna do. Hmm. Oh well, have the crew film bear hunts also. I don't know, at $250 a day for a film permit, I don't know if I want those jokers out there ha in making me incur $250 a day. Last time I sent them out, elk hunting, I told them, you guys go elk hunting this fall. And when Marcus and I are in British Columbia, you guys film each other elk hunting. They went out for two days and they didn't get one bit of footage that could be used for anything. Boom, $500 of film permit fees out the door. I mean, imagine if you worked here and I said, you better go elk hunting for 10 days when I'm gone. Would you do that or would you sit around smoking cigarettes and drinking beer and watching TV? That's what these guys did. And they went out and gave it a half-ass effort and it cost me $500 of film permit fees for them to go out for two mornings. Oh, it looks like it's going to rain. Oh, let's go. I couldn't believe it. So... I, that, that's why, to answer the question, there's a really good chance they may not get to go and do any of the bear hunting this year. I, anyhow. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the crew's going to get even with me someday. I'm, <laughs> I can't even imagine what you guys have up your sleeve, but... Anyhow, you guys got any last questions that I'm missing here? Is there one that scrolled through that I didn't uh, didn't get? Oh, someone wants a blooper episode. Jonathan, you're our bloopers, man. Jonathan put together the Larry outtake. Uh, he put together the Michael bumbling and stumbling and, and stammering. Uh, yeah. Um, you guys got anything more? Let's see. <laughs> Some of you guys are so funny. Some of these questions, it just cracks me up. <laughs> uh, I don't even dare answer some of these questions because if my wife read my answers, I'd be divorced. Uh, let's see. I'm going to find one more. Oh, should I do the bear skin one? Yeah. All right. So someone asked this morning on Instagram, how do you go about skinning a bear for a rug or for a taxidermist? So, here we go. Show you how this works. All right, first thing you do is you find a black bear or a brown bear or whatever kind of bear you want. This one's from Alaska. He's a big one. So, if you can uh, kind of think that this I'm the bear and this hide was on the bear, right? So, sort of like this, All right? So, what you do is you start right down here and you cut it right up here to about right there. And then you got to go out this way. So you cut right here and then you cut. Oh, oh man. Anyhow. These guys were having so much fun with me doing this earlier. I thought I'd do it. So, uh, so. You can see his hide was like this. So you go, whoop, whoop, and then, I don't know how I'd show you the back legs, but I'll try here. So here's his back leg, right? So this was his leg, and so you make a cut right on the inside where the hairline is, up here, and do the other side. So come inside of the back legs, up here, like that. And you skin the hide off the carcass, and then, you got a bear rug ready to go and then make sure you salvage all the meat because bear meat is really good and you quarter out a bear just like you would an elk it's it's a little different but you know front quarters hind quarters loins back straps all that and you're good to go so kyler you're laughing over there my friend what did somebody say something that's funny here hmm What's so funny? People like what you're doing. <laughs> Hold on to your pants, folks. She's off the rails. <laughs> 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 uh.
Uh, Kyler, what else have you been putting up there that I haven't read? <laughs> Someone says, I, my wife just walked in and asked if Randy's been drinking. I can't drink. I can't drink alcohol. I, I've been drinking water. <laughs> Did you guys spike my water while I was out and about or something? Mm. All right. Here's the last question. Samuel Harris, is a 7mm08 a good elk caliber? It's adequate. It wouldn't be my first choice, but this year, Howa just sent me the new Randy Newberg Signature Series rifle. You can now get it in the 7mm08 and the 7mm Remington Magnum. This year, I'm thinking of hunting every species that I hunt this year with my 7mm08. From if I draw a moose tag to an elk to a deer to antelope, and I'm going to call it one season, one rifle. I don't know what people think about that, but anyhow, that's what I'm thinking of doing. And it's going to be a 7mm08. Kaboom! And it's going to be shooting Nosler 140 grain E-tip bullets. Nosler fam fam factory ammo. The Nosler ammo is just crazy good. And when I look at how tight it groups, I get in that 7mm08 with those E-tips. I mean, we're talking like just clover leaf stuff. So it's way, way, way more capable than I ever will be. Um, so with that, folks, I hope you all stay safe. Uh, I hope your lives get back to some semblance of normal. Uh, we don't know what normal is going to be. Who knows what it's going to be going forward, but whatever it is, uh, be safe and uh, get your tags in. Go hunting. Go outside. Go do something. I don't know how it is in your state, but in Montana, when they, there's two cool things about when they did the lockdown in Montana, if you want to call it that. They emphasize that outdoor activities are encouraged. Just stay, you know, don't get in groups of 10 and stay six feet apart. And if you told Montana people you had to stay inside for two months, nah, it, 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 would be, it wouldn't be pretty. And then the governor said, Essential businesses would be, they, he gave a whole list of them, and then the caveat at the bottom was any business that sells firearms or ammunition. Yeah, that is an essential business. Welcome to Montana. Peace. Take care. <laughs>